Channel of Washington. Thank you very much for showing me your headquarters from 1777. Chef Stabe, you are most welcome here any time. I will tell you that my men have been suffering great deprivations, so we are most pleased to see what you will be preparing here today. You know, my menu today is inspired by your lovely wife, Martha. <laughs> I'm Megan. Veal, kidney, mushroom pie, twiggy and smoked ham stew, fried cauliflower, barley primavera, and your wife's great cake. Lovely. We are anxious to taste it, and I do have a goodly number of stories to share with you about our encampment at the Valley of the Forge. And all this for a taste of history from Valley Forge. Wow, spectacular. A Taste of History is made possible by Sandals Resorts, the luxury included vacation. The winter of 1777. A lot of snow, a lot of ice, no food for the troops. General Washington moved into an existing home and made it his field headquarters. Our money is inspired by Martha Washington's presence being with her husband, General George Washington, at Valley Forge. Mother Washington traveled all the way up from Mount Vernon. They would use the headquarters to eat and discuss strategy for the next day. So there was always going to be junior officers, other officers for dinner. We start off with the first course, which is a kidney pie. So the first thing I gotta do, I gotta get a dutchie really hot. The kidney needs a lot of fire. So I'm gonna move the turkey stock right next to the fire. Now let me explain you about the kidney. The kidney's function is to help you keep your blood clean. And therefore, you gotta make sure that we're gonna trim down the inner membrane because if you don't, you're not gonna like your recipe. It will end up not smelling so good. Mushrooms really quick. Here we go. All I gotta do is chop a few onions. I have some little schmaltz in front of me. I have garlic and I have bacon. Now the bacon and the schmaltz goes in first. I want to put a little bit of salt on top of the kidney, just last moment. Pepper. And now put the bacon in the hot skillet. Garlic already chopped. Onion. And now we're gonna simmer a tad. Now comes the kidney. Mushrooms. When you make that, you want high heat. Okay, now we're gonna steal it up and bring it to the landing. Here we go. Wow, I love kidney. All I'm gonna do now with a little bit of brown sauce, very little. Later when it's baked in the oven, in the unsweetened dough, it just adds a certain amount of more flavor into it. Not much. Now, this is gonna be chilled down, completely cold, because you cannot use hot filling into your unsweetened pie dough. It would just fall apart. So now I need to call on Diana, my pastry chef in the city tavern, to help me for the next step. Diana, good to have you here. Thank you for having me, Chef. The next step, I couldn't do without you, you know that. In this classic pat brise, we have cold butter, cold water, cold flour. You wouldn't wanna ruin all of that cold, wonderful crust with a warm filling. So cold filling, cold everything. Got our pat brise made. Good amount of flour. So, gonna flour this up generously. Grab our rolling pin. You wanna roll it out about a quarter of an inch. You can go a little thinner. I wouldn't go much thicker, otherwise you might uh, run into a little bit of gummy crust in between your filling. Beautiful. Set this to the side. Grab one of our tins here. I'm just gonna cut a big old circle. It does not have to be perfect because we're just gonna trim it right over the top. You know, the English were very well known to decorate in all their pies. It's, it's amazing what yeah. they were able to do. So I'm just gonna plop it right down in there and fit it in gently. No holes, otherwise all the filling will leak out. So then I'm just gonna flatten out the top. Take our rolling pin and very easily roll it right over the top. Perfect. Just like it, yeah. 
So I'm going to go ahead and fill one of these. Again, you cannot stress enough. This has to be really, really, really chilled. Oh, yes. Cut some very thin strips here. They don't have to be perfect. They will grow a little bit in the oven, so they'll even themselves out for the most part. And the easiest way to lattice is here, and then lift the whole thing over. So we're going to start in the middle, oh, one and one, and then we'll go this way. I like Aww. a nice tight lattice that way. Not too much filling is showing as you go. And then we'll just flip them up, line the next one down, flip them up, basket weave, exactly the same. So I'm gonna bring this one back over here. And I've got a little bit of egg wash here. It's literally just two eggs beaten with a little, little bit of water. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna just touch the edge. So that it's loose. Yes, exactly. Carefully slide my hand underneath because we can adjust it once it's on top. And then just pull it over. There we go. Cut those little excess off. Slide them away. And voila. We're going to put them in the fridge for about an hour. You want them to be very cold so that all your beautiful decorations don't melt away. And then we're going to bake them at 325 degrees for about 40 minutes. You'll know that they're done because they'll be beautifully golden brown and the filling will hopefully bubble up a little bit over the side. And remember, all the filling is completely cooked, so all you gotta do is cook the dough and it's done. That's right. Anna. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you very much. In honor of Mother Washington, I'm sure she would approve. I, I would hope so. I beautiful. tried to channel my inner Martha. Okay, ready to eat. Mm. Mm-hmm. I love kidney pie. Mmm. Oh, mm. Beautiful Excellent. artwork. You know, I don't usually like kidney, but I think <laughs> that the petite size of it is what makes it so appetizing. I don't know. <laughs> I think everybody should make that. I think you're right. Absolutely. Give it a try. General George Washington and his hobbled Continental Army arrived at Valley Forge in the winter of 1777. Following defeats in several battles, as well as losing the capital city of Philadelphia, Washington understood that his army was no longer in a condition to fight. The war was in turmoil. In physical condition, things were a wreck. The men are worn down. Their equipment is worn down. Uh, their logistical support was practically non-existent. Very early on in this encampment, Washington had to switch from an offensive mindset to a defensive one. Beyond a doubt that unless some great and capital change suddenly takes place in that line, this army must inevitably be reduced to one or other of these three things, starve, dissolve or disperse. At their peak, they might have had over 16,000 people encamped here. That would have made this encampment the fourth largest city in America. The real enemy of the soldier here is disease. More men are going to die here than in any single battle of the American Revolution. At this time of the war, there were questions about the competency of the leadership of George Washington, a thought that seems impossible today. Washington isn't just trying to save his army, he's actually trying to save his job. There are a lot of people who were looking at his failure to protect Philadelphia and rationally wondering whether or not they chose the right man for the job. Openly defying congressional orders to reclaim Philadelphia, Washington chose instead to remain at Valley Forge. He believed his troops needed rest and had hoped to fit his soldiers with warmer clothing and provide food to regain strength. He has been wanting to reform and restructure and train up the army, and he's never had the time over the last two years. Suddenly here at Valley Forge, he has most of his army in one place, not only for a winter, but for half a year. Despite the inevitable death toll at Valley Forge, it was during these years that the Continental Army was able to reorganize, train, and unify under the close eye of General von Steuben. 
This training undoubtedly led to a stronger, more cohesive army that was far more equipped for the ensuing battles to come. When they do decide to leave Philadelphia, so to speak, they will likely march across the Jerseys. Over the course of Washington's military career, his biggest military victory wasn't crossing the Delaware. It wasn't capturing Cornwallis. His greatest victory as a general was keeping this army alive and functioning for eight years. Valley Forge is really one of the very few places that gives a specific tribute to the work and sacrifice experienced by soldiers in war off of the battlefield. And I think they're owed their due. The main course today is a turkey, smoked pork made of the wood vegetables. It's basically a soup or a stew, if you will, that would have served a lot of people at the headquarters of General Washington. The first thing I do right now, I'm gonna butcher the turkey really quick. I already have a turkey stock behind me that I set up earlier with all the other goodies of the turkey, the neck, the stomach. There we go. For this recipe, you take the skin off because it's more of a soup than it's a stew. Cut through the bone, and cut the pieces. The dark meat is preferred for this recipe. I'm taking one breast off, one lobe. It's real easy if you ever do that because all you gotta do is follow the contour of the breastbone. There we go. Take off the skin again. Two again here. So the stock, as you see, obviously is a lot of flavor. Wood vegetables, the uh, innards of the turkey. I have a pot already on the fire. Now remember, this is more of a soup than it's a stew, or soup-stew combination. So now I'm gonna take this in here. And now I'm gonna bring this to a simmer. I have leek, I have celery wood, I have a rutabaga, and it's a beautiful forgotten vegetable nowadays, but it's really gorgeous. Plus it has a nice color and beautiful flavor. Now the turnip will most likely disintegrate, but it gets great flavor. I don't even peel the parsnip, just have it gleaned really good. And a little bit of carrot, same thing here. Don't need to be gleaned at all, just wash really good, which I did. So those are all root vegetables that would have been around during the winter of 1777 without any problem. Now I'm gonna chop up the pork. Just some smoked pork. Remember, it's completely cooked, so I need to just cut it down. And again, it gives you there's a lot of calories in there as you take a look. The fat, it's beautiful. And you remember, Washington loved pork. He had up to 120 and more pork behind his distillery in Mount Vernon, so. Here we go, it's about this much. When you do use cabbage, you want to cut out the core because the core is much tougher than the leaves, so if you leave the core on it, you will have tough cabbage. Poi can go in there now. Lots of nutmeg for that. Now the cabbage will away quickly. All right. If you would do this from scratch at home and you don't have a stock like that, you'd have to cook it much longer. Since my stock was such a powerful stock, I don't need much time to cook it. The turkey took about maybe seven, eight minutes. The pork is already cooked. We're just gonna get the vegetables cooked, but not overcooked, so they're still noticeable. So Diana, you thought you wanna be done after those fantastic kidney pies? I knew you weren't finished with me yet. Well, because I have you here, otherwise I do it myself, but much better if you do it. <laughs> so in keeping with the tradition of what they call today Pennsylvania Dutch, a lot of noodles and dumplings were used in stews like that. And what it does is when you put the noodles in there, the little bit of the flour cooks off almost becomes a little bit of a binder as well. Perfect, easy. Square is the best because then there's no waste either. Yep. I've let the dough come to, you know, slightly less than room temperature, okay. yep, yep. just a little bit of chill so that it doesn't completely fall apart when we throw it in. So you can see there's a little bit of pull back, which mm -hmm. is great. That means that the dough is not gonna fall apart in the hot water. Well, it means it rested extremely well, so that's yes. the, the beauty of it. That's right. The exact amount that I needed. Excellent. 
I'll let you fish them up and just throw them in the bag with the boilers. Okay. So it's like three minutes for the noodles to cook and ready to serve. I cooked a nice big pot. We don't have 20 people here, but we have a hungry crew. And this dish exceeds my expectation. Wow. It don't get better than that. Absolutely spectacular. So the next dish I'm making is barley primavera. Barley was a big grain grown right here in this estate. So what I'm doing right now, I just have some shallots here, some green onions, a little bit of zucchini, carrots, and a few mushrooms. I'm gonna go right over. First thing I'm gonna do is the mushroom, the shallots, the green onion, the carrots, and the onion. So all you wanna do is kind of blanch it. You don't wanna overcook it because you wanna have the crispness of the vegetable. And not everything on a taste of fish tree has lard or meat. This happens to be a vegetarian dish. So we put the barley in. It's a big starch in the city tavern. Oh man, beautiful. Beautiful. Salt and pepper. All right, nutmeg. Pepper, parsley, stew it up. Oh gosh, isn't it beautiful? And blade it up. What makes it so unique is the shallots, and there's just no substitute. A little bit more parsley on top. And what a great side dish. Wow. Mm. The combination of the vegetable, the shallots, the flavor of everything is clean and beautiful. To complement the spectacular menu we did today is a recipe that took me by surprise when I did my research. Hannah Glas in her book from 1745 mentioned deep fried cauliflower. Amazing. Now, what you want to do, you want to cut the cauliflower and get off the florets. The smaller you make it, the nicer it looks. Cornstarch together with all-purpose flour. So I have a little bit of paprika, and then I have some chili powder. And now I'm taking the pre-blanched cauliflower, shake them up like so, and then I'm entering into a grease that's about 375. And now you leave them in there until they're golden brown. This entire menu today is just one of the ones that go in memory books because everything just turned out so great. Oh, wow, delicious, delicious. So we're not done yet. I'm gonna get more messy because next we're gonna make Martha Washington's great cake. The house that Washington would eventually use as his headquarters was owned by Isaac Potts. He was a member of a very prominent family in this area of Pennsylvania. The house itself has a lot of signs of wealth. High ceilings, lots of windows, lots of doorways in and out. Things that you wouldn't find in a normal colonial farmhouse. But all of those windows, all of that extra space was necessary to handle the staff that Washington would have. On any given night, there could be up to two dozen military and civilian personnel in this house with the commander in chief and his wife. So it got crowded very quickly and it was constantly busy. Martha Washington would visit her husband at every major encampment of this war. She was with her husband for half the length of the American Revolution. It's absolutely befitting with this fantastic menu we made to finish it with Mother Washington's great cake. Yes, couldn't be more perfect. So we'll start with three eggs, separate them so you can get started whipping the whites as we need them at a full firm peak. Important if you want to do that, you need a balloon whisk. So to our softened butter here, I'm going to add half of the sugar at first just so we don't spray sugar everywhere and that helps us get a good 
nice cream going as well so that all the butter and sugar comes together nicely and doesn't separate in our cake. Soft butter is the key here. If you try to use cold butter, you're gonna be whipping and whipping and whipping all the way until it separates. Some people always oh. ask me what is buttercream. This is buttercream. So you really wanna make sure these two are very well combined. Nice and light and fluffy. All right, so next, egg yolks, one at a time. So, so far, just like most average cake beginnings. Butter, sugar, eggs. We have some flour here. We also have a little bit of ground mace. Freshly grated, of course. I'm just going to, with my fingers, stir in the spices just a little bit to help them evenly distribute. Just a little bit at a time. So we don't over mix it. A little bit more. Three stages ought to do it. I'm working on the, on the, on the egg white. It's just taking it a little easy. I'm watching oh, you. Of course. By the time you've got everything mixed, that should be ready too. There we go. Teamwork is perfect. You can see it's a relatively yep. dried batter so far. So in order to help the rest of the flour get absorbed, we've got all sorts of good alcoholic fruit it. over there. So I started this recipe yesterday by putting some candied lemon and orange peels in with some dried currants with brandy and Madeira, mm. just to cover the fruit. Um, and it soaked up quite a bit of it. As you can see, they're nice and plump oh, yeah. and ready to go. So we're not gonna use these mm. quite yet. Just set them to the side. However, mm, the leftover booze and a little extra Madeira, add that together. And that is gonna be our liquid for this. Just leaves behind a lovely, lovely flavor. Just take it really slow. That's the most important yeah, part. It's, it's easy to overmix it. Many times. You know how many inquiries we get when people overmix it, the flour breaks or it heats up. So yeah. That's right. So be careful. I recommend you make it just follow your recipe exactly. It's what I'm recommending. I think so too. So that is looking good, very thick. You have to make sure to add a little bit of flour to your soaked fruit, otherwise, even in a stiff batter like this one, if you don't coat them, there's nothing to grip onto and they'll just slide to the bottom of the pan. So I'm just going to add our sliced almonds as well. My boy can on your peak. Oh yeah, almost there. Yep. A little bit at a time. And just the first, the first go round, it can be a little bit heavier handed just to lighten up this thick, thick batter. I'm gonna add the fruit and then into the pan it goes. And you can see the the yeah. volume here is pretty equal, which is exactly how it would have been done. This is just like you said, a more of a fruit cake style of thing. So very, very dense. So gentle, gentle. This part, especially if you're using a mixer at home, do not over mix it. You will end up with a brick of a cake. Our lovely tube pan here that I have buttered and floured. Mm -hmm. I like the nice fluted design of this pan yeah. as opposed to something simpler. <laughs> So much flavor comes out of this. <laughs> wow, huh? Give it a little tap. So into the oven, we're gonna go 300, 325 degrees, depending on your oven, and then about an hour, an hour and a half, uh, you'll know it's done. It's, it'll be nice and high, it'll get a nice crack, and it'll be golden brown. Ah, wow. look at that, perfect. Absolutely beautiful. You could decorate this in so many different ways. Today, I'm gonna keep it simple yep. and just use Good amount of powdered like sugar. Like what you did for the holiday, different decoration, anytime. But from what I understand, it was served many times at uh, Mount Vernon. You know that, right? Yes, of course. You keep, okay. it, you keep it simple and beautiful. Yes, simple and beautiful. Today, we'll just reiterate the dried currants on the inside with some fresh currants. Okay, beautiful. Oh, oh, look at look that. Look at that. You see, that's the flour on the fruit keeps it all the way through, top exactly. to bottom. Otherwise, you would just see this whole mess of them down here. Yeah, no. Mm. No warts. Mm-hmm. Just one. Spectacular. <laughs> and all that for Martha. Yes, I think this one is great. I realized that 1777 wasn't such a beautiful time for many people, but you and I delivered what I think is a spectacular menu. And all this for George and Mother Washington for a taste of history.
A Taste of History is made possible by Sandals Resorts, the luxury included vacation. For the past 10 years, I've gotten so many requests for recipes for my show, A Taste of History. Well, now you can find my favorite recipes in the Taste of History cookbook.